Hello, I'm Ethan Chazen, a New York-based organization development coach. And what I want to talk about today is something that's pretty near and dear to my heart, and that is creating psychological safety for your people inside your organization. Now, this, this webinar is intended to give a proper framework for those organizations who care enough about their people that they actually do want and initiate psychological safety for their employees. So let's dive right into today's webinar. Um, it's important to understand that in the 21st century, there's no longer a need for the historical command control, what we refer to in organizational behavior, the pyramid construct. The pyramid or multi-layered administrative hierarchical organizational structure evolved during the industrial era to create the kind of framework for work to get done. People in an agrarian society realize that they can move to the big cities, go work for big corporations on assembly lines and have a more predictable financial lifestyle by being paid on an hourly basis. And thus, through the industrial revolution, this model was created. It existed actually hundreds and hundreds of years before the industrial revolution with the notion of kingdoms and the people, kings and queens and the royalty who were at the top of society had to exert some kind of control over the people at the bottom, the peasants. So in order to do so, there was a, a requisite need to create levels of power and control and dominance in society. And so that trickled down. So you had the king or the queen, you had the court and the nobility, you had the people who defended the organization, and then you had the people at the bottom. So now if you transfer this model, if you shift it to 20th century, you can easily picture the CEO, um, a, a white male at the time, and their leadership team, what we now call the C-suite, C blank O, C chief financial, chief operational, chief information. You, you get that. That's the CEO as king and the leadership nobility. And then underneath were levels of management. And this is why corporate America understood at the time that in order to maintain this dominant structure, it was all about all about controlling employees, their work outputs. This was, in effect, the prevailing organizational structure that maximized workplace productivity, productivity and performance and efficiency. So farther down the food chain, you have these levels of management called middle management that were responsible for delegating tasks, controlling work, bringing people in, getting them acclimated to the organization, and then all the way at the bottom, in this construct, the peasant, the role of the peasant was played by, and is still today in many organizations, played by frontline staff. What is frontline staff? The people who are closest to the work. They're the ones who are doing the work. They're the ones who are serving clients. This model in the 21st century is, is in the process of dying. Many organizations understand that in the 21st century, dealing with many internal and external factors that I'll get into in a few moments, this model is no longer viable. This focus on maximizing shareholder value in publicly traded companies. It can't exist. And I'll walk you through why. Today's world is too chaotic, too transformational with challenges such as global competition, changing demographics, the shift from a, a majority of countries that are built upon democracies to a shift in dictatorships. The constant ebb and flow between countries in power, countries that are post-industrial, developed nations versus developing nations versus third world, that's all being reconstituted. And then you have things that pop up like unexpectedly, 
global pandemics. And then you have in the United States, you have shifting trends in the American workforce. And this is what I do most often in my consulting practice is help organizations reconcile the fact or prepare for the transition in the structure of our workforce dynamics. So what am I talking about? Every day you have tens of thousands of boomers and matures leaving the workforce, whether of their own volition or they're being phased out in favor of the two fastest growing segments of the American workforce are Gen Z's born between 1996 and 2010 and millennials born between 1980 and 1996. So this reconstitution of the American workforce makes this pyramid command control model not only outdated, but it's, it's literally contrary to what's needed for people to perform and produce and be productive in the 21st century. So in its place, we're witnessing the transition from a hierarchical command control organization that's built on um, toxicity, it's based on control, it's based on subjugating the wants, needs, desires, passions of its people in order to maximize performance, productivity, and profit. That's that's transitioning now. And we see this in many organizations who are going to a flatter, what we call matrix organization. You can see that the levels between the top leadership and the bottom frontline staff, it's being the gap is being narrowed. Why? Because we're seeing a whole bunch of middle management being phased out in favor of the traditional functions. The, the columns of an organization represented by HR, marketing, sales, operations, finance, those cornerstones, those foundations of function are being replaced with project-based teams. And so with project-based teams, you bring in people who have exceptional characteristics, qualities, background, experience, behaviors. You teach them on the job, you cross-train them, you do job rotations, job sharing, you do all the things that are necessary in your organization's power to prepare your rock stars to go from project to project to project, filling in roles in a team collaborative construct. That matrix flatter organization is more adaptive. It's more timely. You can respond to internal and external challenges, threats, opportunities, inherent weaknesses. You can prepare for all that. A lot more flexibility exists in this 21st century flatter matrix organization. What does this mean though? What does it mean for you, the business owner, you, the startup, you, the leadership team? It means that you need to start to think about creating safety for your people, the psychological safety, the freedom, the autonomy, the respect, the civility, the trust, all those things that may sound like warm and fuzzies, they're actually competitive advantages. How the hell do I know? Because I've spent the better part of a decade researching globally, what is it as far as characteristics and qualities that the most successful, the financial top performing companies, those that are number one or number two in terms of performance in their industries and sectors all over the world, what characteristics, if any, do they share? And that led to me publishing, authoring my second book, The Compassionate Organization, where the only characteristic that gives less and competitive advantage is amazing culture. So what does this mean in terms of brass tacks, right? What does it mean in terms of impact for your organization? What it means is your culture is driven by your people having the resources, the autonomy, the trust, the loyalty of you, your, your, your founders, your leaders, the, the people who in the old model were the king, queen, and nobility to create opportunities for people to manage themselves. That's what the whole team-based construct where you focus your best people around projects and initiatives, that's where this is generated from. Self-management is just that. You don't have layers of dedicated people who only manage tasks. And I want you to think a little bit about what the word management means anyway. Whether it's the Latin mano a guerre or the French management, Management is about control. It's about treating people as if they're assets. They're not. That's beneath human dignity to treat people as assets. Management is about controlling and divvying and assigning and allocating people into work. 
This model of self-management is predicated on the reality that your people that you hire are imminently qualified, competent, and intrinsically motivated to go figure out for her or him or themselves how to find people to partner with and work with. Your organization is a conduit. You're the enablers. You are creating through your culture a powerful place. And what is culture anyway? What is it? Culture is nothing more and nothing less than how people act inside your organization. Self-management is you creating an opportunity for people to take control back. They self-regulate, they self-monitor, they self-align, they self-collaborate. What are you responsible for? Creating a, a culture that facilitates searching for these people, finding, bringing them in, empowering them, giving them all the tools, background, experience, everything they need, training, reward, recognition, motivation, coaching, mentoring, feedback. Your job is to foster self-management. So there's a thought, there is a strong thought that control of an organization to, should exist with, if you go public, the people who invest, the shareholders, or perhaps it's the founders, the owners, that they exclusively should have the God-given right in an organization to own it. Ownership needs to be passed down to people in the 21st century for them to have blood, sweat, and tear equity in the game. That's it. That's a practical reality. You don't like it. I'm sorry. But that's a, a necessary prerequisite for the empowerment of your rock stars, your people. You may still think of them as serfs or vassals or peasants, but they're the people who are closest to the work. They're the ones who get the work done. They need to have equity. And employee stock ownership plans, whether your people own a portion, if not the entirety of the organization, it's definitely a opportunity for you to create lasting competitive advantage, if you so choose to go down this road. Another idea that has come, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years in organizations. Your people are closest to the work, right? Whether it's this or this, they're the ones who day in, day out, are tasked with, whether you call them goals, KPIs, getting stuff done. Why not empower them to come up with and reward them for coming up with the ideas that hits positively two areas of financial top performance for your organization? One is top line, the revenue generation. How do you do that? How do you, how do you empower your people to come up with ideas that come up with new products? come up with new services, find new markets, sell additional products or services that match the needs and wants of your client base. That top line, that revenue impact generation comes from your people being empowered, trusted, rewarded for coming up with ideas that you fund. So you set aside every year on a calendar basis, budgetary discretion, you fund idea generation programs. It's all what it's what all the best organizations in the world do. Google, for example, has blue sky initiatives where they allow their people to invest one day a week, 20% of their aggregate work, focusing on what if, what kind of products and services. It's what Google Glasses, Google Drive, all those great initiatives that came from employees being allocated free time and were being rewarded, compensated to take ownership of coming up with products on the top line, services, offerings, and on the bottom line, to be more efficient, come up with ideas to re-architect, redesign your operational processes, systems, procedures that reduce cost. So whether it's top line or bottom line, you're incentivizing your people to come up with great ideas that you're funding them. It's literally a internal startup funding model. Because what will happen is if your people have great ideas and you don't allow them to own them and act on them, they'll leave and start companies. And some of them are going to be quite successful. They could have been your successful internal startups. The next piece of creating the psychologically safe space for your employees through your culture is to take all your business goals for the coming quarter, the coming year, the coming five years, and align those 
with the internal drivers of your organization. So your vision, mission, values, code of conduct, principles, the things that collectively create culture environment for your employees. So what's your vision? It's aspirational. You can't prove whether it's true or not. Your vision is we want to become the safest, most respected logistics company in the world. Can't be proven to be accurate, but it should strike at the heartstrings. It should motivate your people, clients, the media, all those internal and external stakeholders that hear of your vision and see how you allow your people to act every day. Your business practices should be in alignment with your vision and your mission is how to get there. Your mission is tactical, it's operational. So for example, the US Tennis Association to promote the advancement of tennis in the United States. Easy to measure, very simple, everybody can understand it, but it serves as the foundational cornerstone of your business practices. Your values, how our code of conduct impacts how our people act and interact, how they serve our clients, how we treat our employees, how we interact with the communities through volunteer work and community activism, engagement, what we call conscious capitalism. So these collective set of guiding principles that create culture should therefore be mapped out to your business practices to be completely, not only synergistic, that's a buzzword, but to be in complete, you know, interlock. There should be no disconnect between how your business operates day in and day out, what your goals are short and long term, and how you facilitate an amazing culture to help your people feel safe so that they can drive your organization to not only meet but exceed your business goals. So what are we talking about? In the 20th century, for this to happen, right, and you put all the little Jenga kind of pieces in the in, in the, the jigsaw puzzle or the Rubik's Cube, you had to have job descriptions. Not anymore. So job descriptions are an outdated vestige of a command control industrial era. Why are you still posting job descriptions? Well, the answer, although you think it's easy, is completely asinine and outdated. Well, we need somebody that we need to hire with a base level of background and experience who can perform a core set of roles and responsibilities starting immediately, and we'll compensate them at some industry standard between X and Y, given market area, years of experience, competitive landscape. No, uh-uh, because the needs, the wants, desires you have for somebody to come in and start doing that work is going to change almost immediately from the onboard and orientation. Why? Because as they get acclimated to their work in three, four, six, nine months, your internal dynamics are going to change. The composition of your workforce keeps evolving. Externally, you're going to face different challenges and threats, opportunities. You have different strengths and weaknesses. That's all going to change and make that individual who you brought in for one set of skills capable or incapable of performing the task. You also are limiting, significantly limiting the return on your employee investment. What do you mean? Well, what I mean is when you think about it, when you create a job description with a discrete set of roles and responsibilities, you are not taking into account that person, her or his or their prior background, experience, education, certifications, accreditations, study abroad, cultural diversity, language proficiency, all that other stuff that they literally are bringing as a portfolio of skills to the table, you're keeping that portfolio closed and you're saying, I just won one or two of your 10 top skills. And so what you're doing is you're in effect getting pennies on the dollar of your employee investment strategy. So I want you to shift your mindset to create a more psychological safe space from hiring on a set of skills and responsibilities to hiring the most amazing people and then we'll teach them on the job. What does amazing mean? What are the values, attributes, behaviors you look for? It's simple. We have decades of research. You want people who demonstrated through behavioral interviewing, you're going to ask them to show times in their past where they have indicated, displayed intrinsic motivation, collaboration, leadership. They're quick learners. They're problem solvers, critical thinkers. They enjoy a challenge. They go about aligning themselves with other people to solve tasks. If a process doesn't work, 
they re-architect it. If they don't have something on the job to be a success, they go get it, they learn it, they acquire it. That's what you're looking for. The work should be taught on the job. And all the great organizations, by the way, understand this, whether it's Wegmans, Nucor Steel, DuPont, Gore, whether it's uh, Morningstar Company, Chewy, Klein Chobani, Disney, Marriott, Zynga, Google, they all get it. They're built to leverage rock star talent. They teach them the skills needed on the job. So what does psychological safety mean when it comes to people enjoying being where you are? I don't want to hear about pulse surveys. I don't want to hear about once a year we survey our people. I don't want to hear about necessarily employee reviews, which are snapshots in a moment of time. And historically, they're looking backwards at how people feel you treated them before. True job satisfaction is driven at a number of levels. You don't determine what your culture is. Your people do. You don't determine if your people are happy. Your people do. And this is not warm or fuzzy, right? We have decades of research. I don't even have the time to get into it today. But we know for a fact that people who are happier at work, how they define happiness, means that they're more engaged, they perform at a higher level, they produce, they solve problems, they think critically, they come up with new solutions, they come up with ideas, they create new products and services. The factor hit on your, your financial profitability is magnified when you create aggregate collective workplace happiness and satisfaction. What does that mean? It means satisfaction that people enjoy their organization's culture. They feel like your organization through its actions, its interaction with the communities it serves, that your organization's values, beliefs, code of conduct, ethics, morality matches theirs. They feel like they have a voice that's not only heard, but acted on. They feel like they have control, perhaps through ownership. They feel like their work matters and has meaning to them and society. They're proud of their accomplishments, their team's work, and the organization's success. But to get there, you need to give up control. I've said this before, from this to this. I've talked about management being a bad word. Leadership is what's driving people to be empowered. But you need to think about how much control people have over their work and give them the ability to re-architect their job so that they have more autonomy. And so what does autonomy be? This is the whole Daniel Pink model. If you don't know him, go watch the TED Talk. Daniel Pink talks about four key areas in which people are given in your organization greater control over what they do, their work. They're allowed to decide what they choose to work on. Remember, in a matrix organization, we're not with silos of function. We're with projects and identifying people to get together with to work on projects. So autonomy is what they work on and who they work with, where they work from, and when they do the work. Oh, my God. We can't let people do this. Why? Why? Perhaps does your organization, your management structure, your ownership, your business founders, your leadership team, why do you inherently not feel comfortable enabling and driving this? You know the answer, right? You do know the answer. It's predicated on a fundamental truism that you don't trust your people because you didn't hire the best. You have to extrinsically reward them, give them perks, um, give them bonus cards, time off you know, salary increases. It's the carrot or the stick, right? The Douglas McGregor XY theory. You don't feel comfortable giving up control because at heart, you don't trust your people. And that's you. That's a you problem as an owner and as a leader. But you could literally, you could literally by function, by department, by location, by specific leader, you could ask all of their direct reports four questions. Go ahead and do it. I dare you. I double dutch dare you. So you're going to ask four questions. On a scale of one to 10, one is low. 10 is absolute autonomy. How much autonomy do you have over the work you do, 
when you do it, where you do it from, and who you do it with. That'll tell you in a heartbeat if you aggregate the responses by team, by department, by location, you will have a snapshot of real time how much autonomy your people do or do not feel they possess. If you understand that there is so much power in giving up control to reap the reward of your people's collective awesomeness, then you're going to do this. What does work autonomy even mean? And why do we do it? Because your people have the relationships with your vendors, suppliers, contractors, your clients, the media, city, state, federal regulatory agencies. They own them. Remember this? Remember the peasants? Remember frontline staff? They're there every day. They understand how to get the work done most efficiently. They see opportunities for new products, new services, new markets, upselling, cross-selling clients. So what do you do? If you truly understand now that autonomy is to be pursued the right way, you find the best people, you bring them in, you find out what they need, what motivates each and every one of them. So you may hire two people on the same team with the same leader for the same projects, and they may come from similar, let's say, prior recruiting sources like academic institutions or the same organization you, you stole them away from. But those two people who would seemingly be so identical are completely opposite, which means you have to, to build an amazing culture Understand each and every person in your organization, whether it's five or 50,000, you need to understand them individually. And it's time for feedback. So most organizations, feedback is falls under the category of reactive. It's punishment driven. Feedback if and when it's given at all, is I saw you doing something wrong. This is how you need to do it better, more efficient, more effective. I need to improve your performance because I, I've identified you. Again, I'm reacting to witnessing you do, doing something that's suboptimal, right? But there's two scenarios. And far too often, organizations, and I've seen it, I've coached and consulted over 500 of them, they don't do adequate justice to proactive coaching. They got the reactive down. It's punitive when they, if they do it at all, it's reactive punitive. They don't do the proactive. Proactive coaching is leading people to future success by showing them in real time, real feedback, real tangible feedback of when they were caught in the act of doing something phenomenal. You want them to model and emulate great performance by showing them something that they did that was absolutely rock star amazing. So we use in a coaching philosophy that I was trained with called DDI, we use what's called the star approach. I'm going to walk you through that. So whether you're doing proactive, which is the purple or reactive, which is the gold, it's the same approach, but modified. So when you catch somebody in the act of being amazing, you publicly praise them for sure. You publicly praise them, but you want to give them feedback in the moment so it's timely. So what you do is you frame the situation. You give them a little bit of background about what was going on that you observed. What was the task that that individual was required to do? What action or actions did they take? And what was the desired result? Star. It's a very easy model. It's very, very easy to do in practice, but many organizations don't. Why? Because you just don't care. You don't care about your people enough to give them that kind of positive, proactive, timely example of something they did amazing so that they can now, we're in the middle of the 2024 Olympics, they can visualize, psychologically visualize top performance by picturing what they did that was so exceptional. World-class Olympian athletes break down amazing performances into discrete hundreds, if not thousands of component moves you're doing something comparable for your employees. But what is it that happens when you need to give them reactive or adjustment feedback? You've noticed them performing a task and yet they're not optimizing. Well, you could threaten them, you can insult them, often publicly is how it's done in command control organizations, or you can readjust their performance to give them 
pattern picture of positive outcome. So it's the same initial STAR approach as proactive. You explain to them the situation that you just observed. You talk to them about the task that was required, the action that they took and the result they achieved, because those were maybe not the most successful or were not the most likely to achieve the desired result. You give them an alternate action or actions and an alternate result that'll happen. But for that to happen, again, it has to be timely. It has to be specific. It has to be in the moment. It has to be private. And you as a leader, not a manager, but as a leader, have to take dual ownership and responsibility of ensuring the person has what they need. So again, the STAR feedback is universal in terms of it's, it serves two kinds of coaching and feedback mechanisms, the positive, and then where they maybe missed the mark, the reactive or the adjustment coaching is you're giving them the situation and task with an alternate action or actions to achieve an alternate result. And so go ahead, go ahead. As a leader, you're constantly asking these questions of your people. When was the last time I gave you positive feedback? Do you get, or if you're a leader, not a direct report, do you give enough positive feedback? How come you do? Why don't you? And can your superstar employees benefit from positive feedback? For sure. We know through organizational behavior, decades of research into it, that if you want to motivate people to achieve an optimal set of performance and productivity, you give them positive feedback. The worst thing you can do is negative feedback, attacking them, insulting them, breaking them down. Less harmful than negative is nothing at all. If, if you're given two ends of a spectrum of positive or negative, and you can't be positive for whatever reason, just don't give them any feedback because negative is the most destructive. Not having any interaction or feedback with them is also destructive, but less so than negative. And positive is the gold standard. So we talked about that. I wanna wrap up today. We're talking about psychological safety. We're talking about people's needs, wants, and desires. And I mentioned this before. You want a psychologically safe space for your people to thrive, give them an amazing culture. But what does that mean? As I said before, culture is, there, there's many different great definitions, but I like, the, I like the simplest ones as they can be understood and implemented after you watch this video. Culture is how people act every day because of the way you make them feel. Well, the way you make them feel exceptional is to understand them on an individual level. I'm gonna give you two models, a Maslow model and the five universal needs model. So we're gonna talk with Abraham Maslow. So the beauty of his research into thousands of individuals and talking about universal needs was he identified that there are stages to people's need acquisition. And you have to sequentially meet and exceed your people's needs at every level for them and you leading them to move up their performance productivity chain. So the first is the physiological. Do they have the basic elements of being safe? Existence. Assuming their physiological state of existence, and this, by the way, in your organization, this is what we refer to as health and wellness. Assuming that you and they are physiologically okay, they can move up to what's called safety needs. And the safety needs is a sense that there is some semblance of a future that exists. And we talk about it in the field of talent management. We talk about giving people some element of safety in terms of employment. When you say everybody's at risk, when you say people are an asset, people are to be controlled and dominated, and you practice layoffs, whatever the circumstances, you're sending a very clear message. You don't care about their safety, and they should be worried that if anything happens, you know, vagaries in the market, um, changing changing lifestyles, changing competitive landscape. Your, your go-to move, and this started in the 80s in America with the big three car manufacturers, layoffs, and it's so destructive. But assuming you believe that only in the worst case examples, and even then, like COVID, you're still going to protect your people's employment by figuring out creative solutions. You give them an element of safety so they can move up to now I'm able to connect with other people. What are you doing to create connectivity and a sense of belonging in your organization? 
Well, you may say, well, we allow our people to work hybrid or we allow them to be remote. I'm sorry, with over a million dead Americans and in response to COVID and a global pandemic, that ain't good enough. That sense of love and belonging, how do you make people feel a part of something? It's employee resource groups. It's community activism. It's volunteering. It's creating a culture of kindness and caring and empathy and welcoming people of all backgrounds. And don't get me started with diversity, equity, inclusion. That's just a box on a checklist. That's bullshit. I'm talking about the belonging. How do your people feel a sense of your organization? Do you include them? Are you transparent in your communications? Do they know what your code of conduct, ethics, principles are, your North Star? Do they know what your short and long-term business objectives are? Are you constantly communicating? Are they involved in decision-making? All the things I talked about before, that creates belonging. Okay, you have a sense of shared belonging between you, ownership, leadership, and your people. Rise up. Now they have a sense of, I'm valued. I have a sense of self-esteem. I feel a bit of achievement, accomplishment. I have the respect of others, and I respect others I work with and enjoy being on teams with. My voice is not only heard, but people act on my ideas. I have a sense of esteem. And once you deliver that to your people, they can rise up to the greatest level of employee performance and productivity. Here's the thing. And this is why so few organizations not only embrace this, but deliver on it. An employee and the organization working in tandem, at any point, your people can and often do get knocked down one or two levels based on shifts in the market, leapfrog technologies, shifts in supply chain realities. But organizations adapt and individuals adapt on levels to react the things that happen to them individually and the organization as a whole, and that may bump them down. And then once people get bumped down, you have to re-exert and reinstate their ability to climb back up. All for the impact of your employees achieving optimal performance and productivity. There's another model. It's the five universal needs. And I'm gonna kind of rush through these, but reach out to me afterwards. We can talk through it at a level of detail. But if you imagine the Titanic crashing into the iceberg, right? Only a certain small amount of the iceberg was visible above the waterline. In your organization, only a certain number of needs are easily identified that most organizations limit themselves to unleashing their or resolving their people's needs, serving their people's needs. Those are the first two which are stated in real. What does that sound like in practice? Well, you're telling your people, what do you need from us to be successful? You're asking them, right? Point blank. And they tell you, they state it. Well, that's the stated need. That happens in business, in your organization, and in your personal relationships, right? But the minute they tell you, you may ask for a little clarification. Hold on, Jane or John. What I understand you said is, is that correct? And that gets to the real need. But again, that's only a minuscule, myopic, small piece of a human's totality of wants, needs, desires. What's not being served in your relationship with your employees is what's going unstated. And the only way to get to that deeper level, below, peek your head below the water level to see the bigger picture or the rest of the iceberg that'll sink your organization is what they're not telling you often through you building stronger relationships with your people and really getting to know their wants, needs, desires, they'll start to open up to you and give you some of those unstated, those third level. But where we really get fascinating from a psychological and organizational performance standpoint is what happens when you start delivering people with things, benefits, workplace scheduling, teaming, advancement, promotion, reward, recognition, coaching, mentoring, paying for additional education, certifications, training. When you start to get down to that fourth level, you'll know it's a delight need when an employee's basic premise or reaction is, wow, you would do that for me? Yeah, we would do that for you. And the extent of an organization being a world-class organization is you identify things that an employee may not even say or think consciously that she or he or they want for themselves because they never deem themselves able to dream 
that big enough. And as an organization, when you start doing that fifth level of secret need fulfillment, you have now built not only the most productive and highest performing workforce to set you apart from your competition, you've also created an amazingly strong army of VIP brand ambassadors. Last thing I want to talk about is emotional intelligence. It's a very lengthy topic. You can go and you can Google Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N, the godfather of emotional intelligence, but it's a four-step process. It's built upon this notion of you creating a culture, a workplace environment, in which your employees are empowered to identify how they're feeling and then to be able to manage those feelings so that they can start to look outside of themselves and witness the people around them and be observant of their team members so that they can form stronger relationships amongst their peers that optimizes performance and productivity in a new collaborative 21st century matrix team environment. So emotional awareness and being emotionally involved is enabling and empowering your people to take ownership not just inside of themselves, with, with, but with each other. You need somebody in your organization to drive this trend or this transition to emotionally intelligent organizational culture. Set it up. Do some initial training. You need an advocate, a champion at the highest level. Start literally at the three levels of your organization, senior leadership, middle management, and frontline staff, and fund it for two years. But let me explain what this is. It's a four-step process. The beauty of this dance, according to Goldman, is you have to do it sequentially. So I'll walk you through the four stages. The first is self-awareness. How am I doing? That's Ethan asking Ethan every day, how am I doing? How am I in this moment of time? Something just happened to me. How am I feeling? That's self-awareness. That enables me or gives me greater data about myself in the moment to say, you know what? I may be feeling that way now, but at least now I'm aware of it and that gives me greater ability to be self-managing how I'm doing. Once I accomplish that second level of self-management, I can start to be more effective at looking at people around me, observing how they're acting, how they're behaving. I have relationships with them, so I know them pretty well now. I'm starting to pay attention to their cues, their verbals, their nonverbals, how they're speaking or not speaking in team meetings. That's making me more socially aware. That's that social awareness will then at the third stage of me getting through that lead me to the fourth stage of what we call social management or being able to have constructive, productive relationships with others. The last piece of bringing this whole psychological safety into full spectrum is conflict. Now, my coaching, my consulting practice, I've dealt a lot with organizations who want to remove conflict. Hell no. You don't want to remove conflict. You want to actually leverage it as a humanistic engagement strategy to get greater clarity, greater critical thinking, collective critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork by embracing four levels of conflict. We know that conflict is an aggregate set of interactions where there's four broad categories, four strategies, and each of these four strategies of conflict are situationally appropriate or inappropriate. So let me walk you through all four quickly, and we can go through a little bit more detail if you need some clarification when we have a one-on-one. -on -one. But the first is what the traditional conflict is perceived as, I win, you got to lose, and it's called forcing or competing. So it's appropriate when the decision or the outcome is more important to me. We have very little time. I don't care about the relationship with you. I'm going to exert my force of will on you, and I'm going to get what I want because it doesn't really matter to you or you don't see the big picture. And the relationship between us is in something where we have to be collaborative. That's when it's appropriate. When it's not appropriate for me to force my, exert my will upon you and me to try to win, is when we both have skin in the game, it's important to both of us, two or more parties. We need to work collaboratively on this initiative and other work. And we really need to come up with a more creative, robust set of creative solutions. So that's win-lose. There's another solution, which is accommodation. I will lose on this so that you could win. Why? Because it doesn't matter to me. This is when it's appropriate collaboration. 
or accommodation. It doesn't matter to me, but it matters to you. And I care about our relationship and I don't have all of the data. You're the project lead. I just have a little, I'm contributing a bit of my background experience workflow, but you own this and I need to make sure that you're okay because you have a view into senior leadership where they want this project to go. That's when it's appropriate for me to be acquiescing. When it's not appropriate is I'm going to be resentful. I actually do have skin in the game. It's important to me. I don't want to feel like I have to give in just because of your ego or your sense of pride or your sense of self-importance um, where you're forcing me and I'm going to resent it. So the next three, the, excuse me, the next two of the four conflict solutions, one is called collaboration. We both win. We both derive benefit from this shared initiative, this shared approach. It's when our relationship is important. This is when it's appropriate. Our relationship with one another is important. We need to come up or explore the broadest range of creative solutions. We both have skin in the game when we've expressed concerns that the company, the organization really needs to take into consideration on this initiative, that's when it's appropriate to pursue collaboration. When it's not, it's time is of the essence. We don't have the opportunity to be um, involving a lot of democratic you know, uh, voices heard. Um, the issues aren't important to everybody equally. Um, my goals are not as important as your goals, so we have to give and take. So that's when collaboration is not the best approach. But there's a fourth. And it's amazing to me how few of my clients understand that this is one of the four suitable tools of conflict resolution. It's called lose-lose. What? Nobody wins? You know, we're American society. Somebody's got to win. Go big, go home. Um, actually, lose-lose is appropriate when... The outcome's not important to any of us. We need to make a decision quickly where we're not going to be working together at all, if not frequently. So building team is not a critical outcome of this initiative. Time is short. The decision's not important. Come on, man, make a decision. So that's when lose-lose is appropriate. We all kind of just give in a little bit to focus on other things that are a higher priority. But when it's not appropriate, this lose-lose strategy is when we care about the relationship, we want to pursue some creative problem solving or critical thinking. We're looking for creative opportunities when we really, really, really would benefit from conflict because it would force us to further strengthen. It's like muscle use. Embracing conflict when we care about the relationship, when we care about future projects where we have a little bit more conflict and we need to figure out how to work together through it, that's when lose-lose is inappropriate. So I hope as we wrap up, I wrap up this video that I've given you a little bit of insight into why psychological safety is so important. As I said earlier on, I spent about a decade in my practice, in my consulting, researching what it is, what attributes, benefits, characteristics of the most successful organizations all over the world in terms of financial performance? What, if any, attributes do they share? And let me tell you what they don't share. It has nothing to do with country of origin or composition of leadership team or equity stake. It has nothing to do with sectors, clients, product services. What it has to do, the number one or the most salient, relevant characteristics that all top performing organizations share is they have an amazing workplace culture. So please go check out the rest of my YouTube channel. There's over 350 videos, the Chasing Group LLC. I've got two playlists of my Chasing the Dream podcast where I interview executives and business owners of top performing organizations. But please do, if you like this video, smash the subscribe button, share it, for sure like it but I would love for you to check out other videos and see what's valuable. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast today. I hope you found this meaningful and I look forward to seeing you in future videos.